So, first things first, guys, how are you? Very well, thank you. Yeah. Very well, thank you, yeah. Okay. Um, Elephant and Castle, what kind of area is it? It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's had bad press, I think. Um, mm -hmm. It was, it was, it's been used, I think it sort of became the go-to place for people making films about gritty London, um, sort of, uh, um, tough, grimy, kind of like all those awful kind of adjectives. Harry Brown was filmed there. Yeah, Harry Brown was filmed there. Um, it's had a very kind of dilapidated uh, supermarket, um, what do you call them, uh, shopping centre for a while, um, and it's two big roundabouts. So, I mean, on the surface of it, it doesn't have a lot going for it, but actually it's a kind of amazing last remaining pocket of um, un um, gentrified London, mm. and uh, and it's got a huge amount of personality, and uh, and it's where our studio is. Were you aware of this when you set up your studio there? I lived there for about five years beforehand. I've been in in the area for about five years, and and everyone knew the area a bit. Mm. Um, but we were very lucky finding a studio there, and it wasn't that we went looking there specifically, other than that I'd said. I bet there's somewhere around here that's cheap, mm. and uh, and the our studio was advertised as office space, and the the um, landlords, I still don't think really know that what they've got there. Right? That it's a it's a music it's, it was made to be a music studio in the 80s for Jesus and Mary Chain, and uh, and so we moved in very happily and, and started doing it up. And on this record, uh, the new record. Your surroundings have been a, somewhat of an influence on the album. W was it the case with your previous records as well? Um, definitely not as much. It may... Well, for, um, in terms of the sound of the record, I think we were very keen, once we got our heads together about what the album was going to be, to make it sound like a, a place. And that place happened to be the room in the studio room. We wanted to you know, feel like you were in there and you could hear the characteristics of the record because Given the World was a very layered record and, and quite non-specific actually in terms of place because mm. it was so grandiose in a lot of ways. So yeah, we wanted to, it to sound like a place and we, once we were living in Elephant, you kind of, you, you're there so much, you get in between the layers of it, you know, you mm. start to know everyone at every cafe and get on nodding terms with people walking down the road and really understand what's happening there, especially as it's starting to be regenerated now. You kind of uh, you become sort of politically involved in in, in a way because you're kind of conscious of how it's moving. So yeah, I mean, it was kind of it was it was probably was the protagonist of the record in a lot of ways. Yeah. Why this time more uh, focus on on the surroundings than than on the previous one? Do you know was it a conscious thing? I think because it was ours. You know, as much as we're renting it, but we've been there a while. We feel like it's it's ours and. Mm -hmm. Um, we didn't go somewhere else to start recording the record. We didn't. We were there the whole time, and it was our base. And then, and so we feel, you know, loosely part of it all. And then, and uh, quite quite with the other records we've done, we've written them somewhere. You know, you go off and record it in Wales for a couple of weeks, come back. You know, so it ends up being a very uh, a collated mishmash thing. This was all done in that studio, every bit of it, so, yeah. What was the starting point then? Was it a song, was it a certain sound? Well, it's not, I wouldn't want to be putting off uh, the impression because it's um, some kind of, uh, the theme is all stories about Elephant and mm. Castle because it's not really, it's just, uh, it's just very much involved in that area. But I don't think there isn't a specific song that is lyrically No, no, no I know the name check Elephant and Castle, but a lot of the starting points for the, the songs were came from snapshots or, or little things I'd overhear in um, queues for or getting on the bus or, or like walking to the studio in the mornings or um, and some of the just I think all of the everything would have come from that that neck of the woods like it just felt like that was our our um, 
sort of larder. I can't think of a better, you know, like our kind of like, <laughs> that's where we were getting our bits and pieces from. Right. Yeah. You know, what, what's a better word than larder? Um, it was, <laughs> I think larder's perfect, actually. Oh, good. Veg patch. Yeah, it's our veg patch. It's our, our allotment. I mean, I don't know. It's like it was just. That's where that's where a lot of the inspiration came from. Even if it doesn't, I mean, no one people would probably listen to the record and not even associate the two things. Mm. There are more, much more than on any previous records um, references to places in and around London. But it doesn't. I don't think it's necessarily like a, the story of Elephant and Castle in Twelve bite-sized songs, it's, it's not. Am, am I right in saying then that uh, you initially wrote an entire worth, uh, record worth of songs and scrapped them all? No, it wasn't. Uh, it, was, it was an awful lot of music, but it wasn't a record. Okay. It's quite, um, the way we write music means that a lot of ideas have started and they kind of have to have some kind of consensus to normally get finished. Mm -hmm. So the main problem wasn't that we'd had a finished record, and scrapped it, it was that we just couldn't get everyone together agreeing on exactly which way it was going. So a lot of music was half finished and not agreed on. And I mean, a, a lot of music. Do you know why? Why the consensus couldn't be found? Uh, with each record we made in the past, we'd had a bit more of an idea that we were moving from something and we wanted to escape it or, or or do something totally different. And we knew we wanted to make something different this time, but we just didn't know what it was. And it's ended up being, uh, it's ended up being quite obvious actually, that because the last one was layered and cinematic, this one's much more back to the band dynamic and stripped back and like we said, sounds like a place, but it just took a long time to get to that point. And just having those characteristics of the piano, bit of brass, the vocals, and then the players in the band for that, it took a while to realise that that's what the ingredients were for the record. Was there a specific turning point or something that happened when everything fell into place? Or was uh, it something gradual? No, well, we did get um, Laurie Latham, who did both Ian Jury's records and Echo and the Bunnymen. He came and uh, spent a couple of weeks just sitting in with us, just going, just listening and saying, that's good, keep going, that kind of thing. And that in, in that uh, couple of weeks, we did spit it out, which kind of sits in the middle of the record somewhere. And that was the, f that was the first thing where everyone left going like, yes, that, like, you know, that sounds new and like the Maccabees and something we could all agree on. And so from that point on, all the other bits of music that, you know, they started to, we started to be able to find homes for them really. Well, the, the way you describe it, it, it was quite an arduous project, uh, pro process, then, especially in the beginning. So how do you uh, keep going in a sense? It, it sounds a bit weird, but how do you keep yourself focused on, on what needs to be done? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. It was, there, was like, there was definitely moments when we weren't sure if it was going to work out. Um. And as, as well, sometimes you're sort of so far in that you you can't go back. Mm. Like you've got to just keep going. So, um, yeah, there was lots of lots of umming and ahhing, and and everything seemed to have to go all the way around the houses to come back to where it started. And but um, but the kind of the the negative of having five people with different opinions is that, and the positive is that. At any one time, you could have four people all feeling down in the dumps, and one person won't, and we'll p pick everyone up, um, and and so you sort of share the load. Yeah. And well, you mentioned uh, the producer, uh, Laurie Latham. When did he come into everything? Then was it something where you didn't know what to do, and then yeah. well, let's find some he help. Didn't, um, yeah, no, he didn't actually do any. Well, he did actually do a bit of additional production, like in okay. uh, on Marks to Prove It, but he didn't actually produce anything. It was Hugo, my brother, produced the record uh, along with us. But um, he, he, more than anything, he was just a referee for a couple of weeks when it was really like, I don't know if we've got anything, and we just trusted his musical opinion, got along with him, everyone liked him, so he just sat in and went, 
that's good, keep going, you know. But was it something where you actively sought him out to fulfill that role? We'd met him at a Christmas party. <laughs> he, our, our manager used to manage him, mm. so we you just knew him from them. And he wasn't, you know, he wasn't anyone's specific friend. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So he was a kind of a... I got his uh, secret Santa that year, which was a picture of Tommy Cooper, which lives in my... This heart cupboard, cupboard with my hoofer, which is oh, my right. heart. I'm yeah. covering the machine. <laughs> but once he came in, well, was that the, the turning point? And where what, what song was first finished then after he came in? And that kind of yeah. I mean, uh, like I said, we did spit it out with him. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that was that was the first that was the first song and was finished on the record, I think. Mm. Yeah. And then did you notice that? the songs that you were writing afterwards or, or during kind of gravitated towards that song? I think just that what we saw with, with that song was was the was the kind of a bit of a framework and a, a little bit of a, a kind of the tools that we were using on that song we could apply to some of the other 70% finished songs and Though I don't think anything ended up sounding like Spit It Out, just some of the the kind of processes we used on Spit It Out, we could apply to other things, and that seemed to take them on another 10, 20, 30 percent, and in some cases, finish them. So it was just it just gave us a bit of a yeah, gave us the tools.